When I think that I might be 99.9% the same as him, I can't even fathom it. So I say that to you. Do we have all these other problems? Is Darfur a tragedy? Do I wish America would adopt sensible climate change regulations? Do I hate the fact that ideologues in the government doctored scientific reports? Do I disagree with the thousand things that are going? Absolutely. But it all flows from the idea that we can violate elemental standards of learning and knowledge and reason and even the humanity of our fellow human beings because our differences matter more. That's what makes you worship power over purpose. Our differences matter more. One of the greatest things that's happened to me in the last few years is doing all this work with former President Bush. You know, hes I ought to be doing this. I'm healthy and not totally antiquated. He's 82 years old, still jumping out of airplanes and still doing stuff like this. And I love the guy. I'm sorry for all the diehard Democrats in the audience. I just do. And... Life is all about seeing things new every day. And I'll just close with two stories, one from Asia, one from Africa. And I'm telling you, all the details don't matter as much as this. After George Bush and I did the tsunami, we got so into this disaster work that Kofi Annan asked him to oversee the UN's efforts in, uh, in Pakistan after the earthquake, which you acknowledge today, and asked me to stay on as the tsunami coordinator for two years. So on my next to last trip to Aceh in Indonesia, the, by far the hardest hit place, quarter of a million people killed. I went to one of these uh, refugee camps where in the sweltering heat, several thousand people were still living in tents, highly uncomfortable. And my job was to go there and basically listen to them complain and figure out what to do about it and how to get them out of there more quickly. So every one of these camps elected a camp leader. And when I appeared, I was introduced to my young interpreter, young Indonesian woman, and to this, the guy who was the camp leader, and his wife and his son. And they smiled, said hello. And then I looked down at this little boy. And I literally could not breathe. I think he's the most beautiful child I ever saw. And I said to my young interpreter, I said, I believe that's the most beautiful boy I ever saw in my life. She said, yes, he's very beautiful. And before the tsunami, he had nine brothers and sisters. And now they're all gone. So the wife and the son excused themselves. And the father who had lost his nine children proceeded to take me on a two-hour tour of this camp. He had a smile on his face. He never talked about anything but what the people in that camp needed. He gave no hint of what had happened to him and the grief that he bore. We get to the end of the tour. It's the health clinic in the camp. I look up, and there is his wife, a mother who'd lost nine of her ten children, holding a little bitty baby less than a week old, the newest born baby in the camp. And she told me, I'm going to get in trouble for telling this. She told me that in Indonesian culture, when a woman has a baby, she gets to go to bed for 40 days and everyone waits on her hand and foot. She doesn't get up. Nothing happens. And then on the 40th day, the mother gets up out of bed, goes back to work and doing her life, and they name the baby. So this child was less than a week old. So this mother who had lost her nine children is here holding this baby. And she says to me, this is our newest born baby. And we want you to name him. Little boy. So I looked at her and I said through my interpreter, I said, do you have a name for new beginning? And she explained and the woman said something back and the interpreter said, yes, luckily for you in Indonesian, the word for dawn is a boy's name. And the mother just said to me, we will call this child Dawn, and he will symbolize our new beginning. You shouldn't have to meet people that lose nine of their ten children, cherish the one they got left, 
and name a newborn baby Don to realize that what we have in common is more important than what divides us. You're... This... And I leave you with this thought. When Martin Luther King was invited here in 1968, the country was still awash in racism. The next decade, it was a wash in sexism, and after that, in homophobia. And occasionally, those things rear their ugly head along the way. But by and large, nobody in this class is going to carry those chains around through life. But nobody gets out for free, and everyone has temptations. The great temptation for all of you is to believe that the one-tenth of one percent of you which is different and which brought you here and which can bring you great riches or whatever else you want is really the sum of who you are and that you deserve your good fate and others deserve their bad one. That is the trap into which you must not fall. Warren Buffett's just got about to give away 99 percent of his money because he said most of it he made because of where he was born and when he was born. It was a lucky accident. And his work was rewarded in this time and place more richly than the work of teachers and police officers and nurses and doctors and people who cared for those who deserved to be cared for. So he's just going to give it away. And still, with less than 1 percent left, have more than he could ever spend. Because he realizes that it wasn't all due to the one-tenth of one percent. And that his common humanity requires him to give money to those for whom it will mean much more. In the central highlands in Africa where I work, when people meet each other walking, nearly nobody rides, when people meet each other walking on the trails, and one person says, hello, how are you, good morning, the answer is not, I'm fine, how are you? The answer tra translated into English is this. I see you. Think of that. I see you. How many people do all of us pass every day that we never see? You know, we all haul out of here. Somebody's come, and come in here and fold up 20-something thousand chairs and clean off whatever mess we live here and get ready for tomorrow. And then after tomorrow, somebody will have to fix that. Many of those people feel that no one ever sees them. I would never have seen the people in Aceh in Indonesia if a terrible misfortune had not struck. And so I leave you with that thought. Be true to the tradition of the great people who have come here. Spend as much of your time and your heart and your spirit as you possibly can thinking about the other 99.9%. .9%. See everyone and realize that everyone needs new beginnings. Enjoy your good fortune. Enjoy your differences. But realize that our common humanity matters much much more. God bless you and good luck.